Hello everyone, you're very welcome to this video. Today we're thinking about the men who studied the stars and their findings. They looked up, they saw, it informed what they believed and then they got up and actually went to find out for themselves. Now behind me you'll see I've got my three wise men carrying three gifts and they do appear to be next to shepherds in my nativity as they are in most nativities but maybe it didn't quite work out like that. So what do we know? Well if you read Matthew 2 verses 1 to 12 please do read that to be reminded of what happened at this point in the story. But we are in we are in Bethlehem. Mary, Joseph and the baby Jesus, our Messiah, our King of Kings, our Lord of Lords, they're still in Bethlehem, probably not in a stable. At this point, they may well have found lodgings and that is where they are. That is where they're found, but that's not where the, the wise men, the Magi actually start out. So what do we actually know? Well, we know that Mary and Joseph no doubt would have been pondering all these strange happenings and they may well have been really planning to go back home to Nazareth. This is after the dedication of Jesus in the temple. And then we get to uh, Matthew 2 verse 1, which says soon afterwards. So soon afterwards, some men who studied the stars came from the east to Jerusalem. They go to Jerusalem first. Now they are a really, really impressive delegation. And if you cast your mind back to our nativity plays that we've had, if you get to be a king, you get to wear sparkles, don't you? So magi, that's where we get our word magic from. I'm going to explain why we have three and um, why we call them kings in a minute. But there's no grounds for supposing the Magi were three in number. Apparently, Leo the Great in AD five, 450 um, suggested that there were three kings. Three because of the number of gifts, gold, frankincense and myrrh, and kings because of the fulfilment of biblical prophecy. And that prophecy is Isaiah 60 verse uh, 3, which says this, nations will be drawn to your light and kings to the dawning of your new day. There's also other prophecy. If you go to Daniel, that's Daniel chapter 5 verse 7, Magi actually uh, were, were kept in Babylon and they would um, inform the kings, they were advisors to the kings on the manners of the planets and the stars. And they would speculate the significance of what was going on up in the heavens. Now, historians tell us around about this time, and in fact, years and years before, there was kind of a belief that there would be a child born who would be king of the Jews and this child would have power and dominion over all the world. And I've mentioned this to you before, the Jews were waiting for a Messiah, but not the kind of Messiah that they got. So for these Magi in the East, they would have been well aware of the prophecies. When they looked up to the skies and then suddenly saw this, all of a sudden, it would have made that link in their mind's eye of, of what they knew anyway. This was significant and this meant a child had indeed been born. They also believed that this child would come out of, I guess, out of the ordinary uh, ruling elites of the time. There was so much chaos, um, so much uh, trouble that they were looking outside of the current leadership structure. So it's in this context, it's not really that surprising that when the Magi looked and saw, they realised this was significant and this related to the birth of a child. 
Now, there's been lots of um, attempts to explain what exactly the star was, what was going on with the planets, what this unusual phenomenon actually was. Um, and I don't intend to go into a lot of detail about this here, but some people have written about um, Jupiter and also Saturn and this constellation of Pisces and said that it may well have been linked to that. Some of the people have written that there would have been kind of three, uh, three constellations. There would have been uh, three, uh, three very bright stars over three different periods of time, which might have accounted for the journey that they took. But it's conceivable, and it is conceivable, that the Magi observed this constellation and that indeed is is why they ended up in Jerusalem and it would have taken them no doubt five months to actually get there but something happened they saw something and it made all the difference to them and it made all the difference to Mary and Joseph as well so we can't be that precise about what exactly was going on in the stars um, does it imply a miracle? Maybe, maybe not. But what we know happens is that they were informed to such an extent that it made them get up and move and go on this journey, this adventure, which would have indeed been very, very dangerous. So we've got some awkward questions here. Now in Jerusalem, they asked around where is the baby born to be king of the Jews? We saw his star when it came up in the east and we've come to worship him. That's Matthew 2 verse 2. Unfortunately, unfortunately for them, they arrive when the succession to the throne in Jerusalem had been a matter in which several parties had a vested interest. And Herod, who was the reigning king, was increasingly showing signs of having a very serious sickness. Suffice it to say here that five days before Herod died, he and his son murdered and changed his will for the umpteenth time. So the succession of the King of the Jews was a bit of a, a red hot topic in what was virtually this police state ruled by this awful king. So we're not surprised then to learn that when King Herod heard about this he was really upset and so was everybody else in Jerusalem as well. He was upset because it called into question his own succession to the throne. And the people were upset in case he might vent more violent behaviour towards them. They were, of course, his unfortunate subjects. The king, however, remained outwardly really quite calm and decided to be party to the matter and not just let it end there. So it says he called together all the chief priests and the teachers of the law and asked them, where will the Messiah be born? In the town of Bethlehem in Judea, they answered. For this is what the prophet wrote. Bethlehem in the land of Judah, you are by no means the least of the leading cities of Judah. For from you will come a leader who will guide my people Israel. So it's, it's quite interesting that he gets this really clear answer really quickly. But apparently this messianic expectations of the Jews was never far from the front of their minds. It's not a difficult question for the experts, those who knew their scriptures. So Herod had the answer to the visitors' questions. He wasn't, however, going to divulge this information openly, and he wasn't going to let people know about this widely either. He was a calculating man and there was a piece missing that he needed to put in place. Herod called these visitors from the east to a secret meeting and he found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. 
Now that gave him the likely age of the child. Now he then made that awful calculation. And we know, and we'll be thinking about that um, next week, we know what he actually did. He knew the first appearance of the star and because of the information from those who looked to the stars and the experts, he could deduce the age that the Christ child would actually have been. Now, if it was anything like the kind of phenomenon I've described there, the child could have been about six months old by the time that the men from the east arrived in Jerusalem. So when he got this information, says Matthew 2 verses 7 and 8, he sent them to Bethlehem with these instructions. Go and make a careful search for the child. And when you find him, let me know so that I may too go and worship him. So it's an unlikely story and the visitors were not taken in by it. They were among the keenest minds of the time. These were clever people. They would have smelled what was going on there. They saw that Herod had this ulterior motive and Herod didn't intend to worship or pay homage to the Christ child, but he intended to kill every possible rival to his throne. Let's move to some indescribable joy now, shall we? Now, as they left and went south towards Bethlehem from uh, Jerusalem, um, again, the star brighter than ever before appears ahead of them and then it stops over the place where the child actually was. And when they saw it, how happy they were, what joy they had. It's Matthew 2 verse 10. And the language of Matthew is, is, is unrestrained. It was the moment of moments in their lives and they weren't even Jewish people, but their years of study had led them to this unprecedented experience. And there were just no words to describe what they found, what they saw. So what was the appropriate response? Well, they go into the house and when they see, see the child with his mother Mary, they kneel down and they worship him. And this was behaviour only used for a god or a divine person like a king, somebody who was believed to be like a god. And that belief was common in Asia. Now, we don't know what contributed to their conclusion that this tiny, tiny infant in this common house should be given this ultimate accolade. But they did. They did. They were Gentiles. And they would know from the Jews of the East, because uh, there were many Jews living in the East, they would have known that this was significant. They worshipped the one who they said was the only God and not to be represented by any kind of idol. So clearly, uh, by some means not spelt out for us, God had not left himself without a witness in the minds of these men and the journey to find Jesus. And this was just the pinnacle of that adventure, that, that, that journey, that story. And it was a link between the stars in their courses in the heavens, their interpretation of them, and that explicit guidance from Herod's sources, and then them finding the infant and the mother all combined to bring them this joy and their impulse, their impulse is just when they meet Jesus to just worship him. When you meet Jesus, the impulse is always to worship him. So in what kind of house uh, did they find this little family? And how large was it? Were they all kneeling at once or did they go in one at a time? We don't know, but we somehow get the impression that they were all tall, don't we? After the worship, 
came the giving of these unusual gifts. They brought out their gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh and presented them to him. And they were the gifts truly fitting for a king. They'd come prepared to meet a king. And it shows how deeply they were convinced that their journey would lead them to the person that they were actually seeking. That's verse 11. So the imagination of Christians from early times have seen in each gift a special significance. Myrrh for human nature, gold for a king, frankincense for divinity or gold gold for the race of Shem, myrrh for the race of Ham, incense for the race of uh, Japheth. These are only the product of people's imagination, only mentioned because of their legendary influence and their influence in Christian poetry and Christian art. But of course, um, if you think about frankincense, the smell of frankincense, frankincense being burnt, lifted. Incense was burnt in the temple to help elevate the prayers of the people. Frankincense was the smell of divinity, the smell of God. Gold, of course, fit for a king and they most certainly would have needed money. But myrrh, myrrh used, of course, uh, we know, to preserve the body after death. So now we move into this diversion. Any suspicions that they had about Herod's intentions were, were confirmed to them when God warned them in a dream not to go back to court and to return by another route. That's verse 12. So their need to change their route is the first indication that Simeon's scary prophecy was not misplaced and you'll read that in Luke 2 verse 34. Before the child was many months old, before the child was many months old, there were those who wanted to get rid of him. There were those who wanted to kill him. And so in this manner, these really mysterious people, the Magi, disappear from the story and they leave behind so much for us to think about. They're important because they bring another corroboration of the story of the incarnation from people who could not be charged with any bias. They were Gentiles, Gentiles for whom strict Jews had only got contempt for and yet they're drawn into the story, they're drawn into the narrative, they are eyewitness observers. They are there and they see the Christ child worthy of worship and those gifts are rare and valuable. So what should our response be? Well, they make us question what our response should be to this person, Jesus. They came with evidence. They responded to what they saw, not just in the stars, which led them to an adventure like they probably never, ever would think they would have ever had. But it led them on a spiritual awakening. And they felt it was the response of worship, worship that was demanded and they bowed low before him. And we need to do the same. We need to do the same. So the Magi, where we get our word magic from, those from the East who looked up and knew they had to make the journey. And when they found the Christ child, they wanted him protecting. And before they did that, they knelt and they worshipped. And my picture of them just bowing really low and the baby gurgling, maybe even crawling, and Mary looking on as ever, pondering 
those things in her heart. So I hope you'll be able to ponder these things in your heart as well. Take care, everybody. God bless. And I'll see you soon.